Um, so our structure for the, for the class today, I will be giving a lecture in the beginning, followed by Susan, as, as we usually do. Um, we're going to have a short break, and then we actually have a really amazing guest speaker for you. Um, his bio, as well as an interesting article about him um, from the New York Times is on everyone's desk, so feel free to look it over, uh, preferably during the break and not during lecture. <laughs> um, but, you know, Brian is, you know, the, just an amazing aspirational human being to be like um, and someone really to, to talk to if you want to get engaged in a lot of community action happening locally um, against, against uh, police surveillance and just surveillance state in general. So our talk today is about connected homes, smart cities, and the surveillance state. So I, this lecture, I like to start with a TLDR. Um, and for those of you who don't know what a TLDR is, it's OK. It's a too long, didn't read. Um, as in, you know, there's a lot of material, but just the takeaways are uh, a, a lot of smart city initiatives or, uh, are sold on the value proposition of, quote, safety and security. And particularly in a country like the United States, a security narrative, if you look at the size of our military industrial complex, a security narrative is very, very profitable. Um, so, but this value proposition is by design exclusionary, perpetuates fear, and, and creates a surveillance state. So the question often is asked, what's the difference between a smart city and a surveillance state? In its current form, there is no difference. A smart city is a surveillance state because they are both sold on the, the notion that you have to find and catch bad people. And by doing so, uh, we, we, we create a world in which the only way you catch bad people is by constantly watching everybody and policing people's behavior. So the takeaway from my discussion here is to talk about how we this quote disrupt the corporate owned smart city by repurposing retrofitting and re reinvigorating that was one of our readings for today so we're going to talk a little bit about the examples of you know the three r's so first i want to define the surveillance ecosystem so there's a lot of talk about facial recognition um, and and the, i've had a lot of conversations with journalists about this this almost obsession with facial recognition as like the surveillance technology and and to be honest, it's probably not as widely used as other surveillance technologies, which I suppose maybe people find more innocuous because it doesn't seem as scary as your face. And interestingly, actually, I was told by journalists is um, it's very hard to put an image or visualize or show what surveillance is, but facial recognition is easy, and we've all seen the same picture. It's like someone's face and all the dots, and it's connecting all the dots, right? So there's an image around facial recognition, which is why it's easier to portray as the scary narrative. And quite literally, facial recognition reminds us of all the movies we've seen, right? Whether it's Minority Report, whatever it is, right? Um, but the surveillance state is more than just facial recognition. Um, it, it, ultimately, it's characterized by private or foreign actors controlling the civic digital backbone. The scariest part, one of the scariest parts, but actually from my perspective, frankly, the scariest part of a digitized urban environment is the fact that all these things are being privatized. Now, if I were to tell you Amazon's going to pave the roads from now on and they're in charge of that, I think there would be uproar in the streets. So people would, like, people would say, you know, why, why is a private company responsible for deciding where highways go and if potholes get fixed in my municipality? That should be what government does because they're responsive to the people. And yet our digital infrastructure, our digital highways, where we store our data, our cloud-based systems, right, the databases, uh, these are all private contracts. They're owned privately. There, there aren't separate government entities that do this work. Um, and just to give you an example, um, the, the biggest, quote, military provider now is going to be um, Microsoft. Uh, sorry, Amazon, because uh, Amazon just won Project Jedi. Um, and Project Jedi is uh, a, a very big ticket project to move all of our national security data into the cloud. So now we're going to have a private company um, that is in charge of all of our national security. Um, so while, while there are plenty of laws, regulations, and limitations, this data, this information is ultimately managed, owned, and stored by a private corporation. And this is not something that we would accept if it were our physical infrastructure. So uh, the surveillance ecosystem is characterized ultimately by private or foreign actors controlling the civic digital backbone. And th this infrastructure is very important. So while facial recognition may be flashy, interesting, more interesting to talk about, or you know, be more photogenic in terms of the media, the big fear here are things that sound very boring. Uh, Cloud-based data systems, for example. Um, online monitoring tools. 
financial software, government services such as citizenship, birth records, and passports all being stored on a digital basis. And I mean, I, I love the fact that I can renew my driver's license online, but then you think through how that infrastructure is created, where that data is owned and stored. And there's, there's also even been movements to um, create a digitized driver's license so it would be on your cell phone. But can you imagine a world in which that data was hacked maliciously or held for ransom or just managed and stored improperly? Um, we, would, we would have no, no recourse. And worse, we would have no ability to even prove that we literally existed. It's, it's genuinely frightening. And if you watch the new Blade Runner, uh, they, they actually do kind of have a moment where that, that happens. So the, um, the new Blade Runner movie, uh, they, they refer to a moment in history where um, everything based, all, all the data in the world got wiped out. And this is things like digital photos, but things like your identity. Everything is what your financial records, everything has disappeared. So as we privatize this very valuable public information, um, the fear is that this is all owned and, and uh, managed by private companies, which from a political scientist perspective, leads to something called regulatory capture. So when we want to, let's say, regulate these behemoths, right, these massive companies that own this data, how, how, can, we, how can lawmakers in good faith and good ability legislate against the companies that are responsible for quite literally a functioning society, right, our functioning civic infrastructure? And so last point, and to talk a little bit about last week's topics, digitizing creates data. So if you read uh, the New York Times article about Brian's experience, right, um, when we were talking about license plate tractors last week, uh, quite literally by collecting, storing, using this data, um, it, it, it is now like uh, basically in, not incorruptible, um, uh, like non-degradable, like it will forever live in some database that is privately owned. Oops. Do you know if they'll autoplay, Tara? Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, I'll just use the old-fashioned way. So I'm going to show you a quick video of the kind of narratives. There you go. This is a Super Bowl commercial from last year for something called Simply Safe. I mean, this, this is a Super Bowl commercial from last year. I mean, you can see the kind of narrative that's being pushed forward. This is, you know, this is just for regular people to bring surveillance into their homes. Um, and, and I know we don't have a lot of articles about Amazon Ring Doorbell, et cetera, um, but I, I highly suggest you look up a lot of the conversation discussion happening around Ring Doorbell, how they're linking with local police, um, and they're actually uh, using, uh, they're using the information that people are, are basically giving them off of their home security systems that face outdoors, and the police are using this information. But you can tell that there is this narrative of, quote, safety and security. Now, what's the problem with that narrative, right? So, okay, oh, do we live, we live in these, like, scary times, um, you know, uh, bad things happen. Um, well, when we have a narrative of safety and security, there always has to be an other. There has to be an enemy. By, by definition, there is somebody you are looking for. Um, but who gets to decide that? You and I don't get to decide that because these are not decisions made by elected lawmakers, by the communities. These are actually decisions made by parties that are not citizen accountable, often the military and the police. Because when we talk about safety and security, we are going straight to non-elected officials, military and police. What this happens around the world, and we're gonna talk about this 
a little more next week in the conversation on algorithmic colonialism. But this contributes to nationalistic, anti-minority, and anti-immigrant sentiment. Because when you have to find the other, the other never looks like you. Right? It's, it's always the, 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 kid in, the black kid in the hoodie. It's always the, you know, the strange looking person in your neighborhood. And as I mentioned, there is this possibility of regulatory and, uh, regulatory and political capture. And again, as, as, a data sci as a political scientist, um, it's quite important that we think about these things. So as I mentioned, privatizing all of this information, all of this data, and in actually increasingly being owned by only a handful of companies. And then on the other end, you have you know, many presidential candidates on the Democratic side calling for trust busting of big corporations. How will you accomplish that when all of your data is being housed, stored, managed by the very companies that you say you want to break up. That there is a conflict of, and this is, this is not a new story, this is a very old story about government and, and working with the private sector. So like one common theme you'll see here is like, these are not new narratives, these are new technologies, but these are not new narratives. So the three big things that we think about, number one, as I mentioned, privatization of our civic digital infrastructure. Second is the hidden militarization of our streets. And third is the, digitiz the digitization of existing tensions. So as I mentioned, privatization of our, of our uh, civic infrastructure, um, I actually messaged Jason Sadowski and I'm like, I think I quote you in, in every, uh, every lecture I've been giving because his, his work is, is, is so on the nose. Um, he, he has really, really great articles. Uh, as an aside, he has a new article in Real Life Magazine um, you can look it up online, and it's actually about insurance tech and the use of things like um, GPS trackers, uh, uh, like Fitbits and wellness trackers, et cetera, to do things like, uh, um, to do basically actuarial work, uh, to, to, to determine the rate on your insurance, how much they should insure you for, whether or not you should be insured, and even if it's things that are very spurious, like um, do you drive at odd hours of the night? Uh, and things like that. So really great article, I just wanted to plug, get, give you a plug for that. But he has a really great quote, um, and what he says is, the smart city is not a coherent concept, let alone an actually existing entity. It is better understood as a misleading euphemism for a corporately controlled urban future. So again, this is not one technology, it's not one, one thing, it's not facial recognition. It is a suite of technologies being used uh, for many different purposes, but all under the same umbrella of, quote, safety and security, and often, actually, efficiency. Um, so, for example, a joint venture between the NYPD and Microsoft, um, according to the NYPD, utilizes the largest network of cameras, license plate readers, and radiological sensors in the world. Um, and, and one of your readings for this week is a, a, a Carnegie Endowment paper on the rise of the global surveillance state. Like, just please read it over. I think it came out last October. Um, as I was reading it, I felt like the, analyst, the individual who wrote it um, was al almost literally crying out for help. Like he's like, you know, th there's this massive rise of surveillance technologies and there's nothing and no one that's really stopping it. Um, so, you know, we have these, this massive network of, of um, technological tools that are being used in very spurious manners uh, to, to continue to police um, and monitor the very people that have been constantly marginalized by society. The second thing that happens is you end up with a privacy marketplace. So when you privatize, right, when, when it's private companies owning this information, um, it leads to obfuscation and the ability to create privileged spaces. And this is, um, this is from one of your readings from today. Uh, an infrastructure is turned into a marketplace, quote, empowering technologies and services is reserved for the customers who can afford the access. So again, you think about things like Ring Doorbell. It is something you have to pay for, pay to install, and have a subscription service for. Simply say, same thing, I mean, it's like $10 a month, but it costs a couple of hundred dollars to buy. So who is watching and who is being surveilled? And again, same old narrative. But now, as the privileged party, you now get to participate in, in the privatization. You are now included in that narrative, and you are part of excluding the other. So we all then become complicit in the exclusion when it's our ring doorbell footage that's being used for the police to track and monitor individuals. Then that starts to raise the question, who is a citizen, who matters, and who counts? If we're all meant to be equal, but then some of us are watched more than others, then who is actually being treated as somebody who belongs here? The second thing to think about is hidden militarization. So it's, it's quite interesting to me how almost quickly and quietly these technologies have taken over many of our urban space. So when I say urban spaces, by the way, 
I think a lot of people's minds go right to like, oh, China is doing this, and China is like the ultimate straw man argument in all of these things. And, but I am not talking about China. I am talking about like Oakland, like you will hear today from Brian. I'm talking about Los Angeles, I'm talking about San Diego, New York City, Detroit, uh, Baltimore, New Orleans. Like, I, I, we don't even need to go beyond the United States borders to have this narrative, have this conversation. Um, so, you know, for example, the, the use of stingrays is actually not a new thing at all. So as I mentioned, like facial recognition has sort of caught the public narrative, but a lot of this technology has slowly been being built and used over time. So give, given, giving you an example of stingrays, um, when merged with body cameras and CCTV cameras, you can, uh, you can literally quite, uh, quite uh, easily monitor people's public, uh, public movements. And by the way, with all the talk of 5G, with the creation of true 5G, uh, this will be much, much easier and much, much faster because you'll be able to actually use GPS data and like cell phone tower ping data to pinpoint someone to a few feet versus now where it's actually a wider, a wider range. Um, so 5G is actually going to enable all these things to, to move and work even faster. But to think through the notion of militarization um, and to maybe bring a more philosophical slant to this, when we think about the concept of the rule of law, right? Um, you know, do, do, we, do we exist and, and what creates a flourishing society? Do we exist in, in a, a functioning, flourishing society because we're all constantly worried that we're going to get arrested by the police? If so, why isn't there a police officer with a machine gun on every corner? Because that's going to get rid of crime, right? We're going to have zero crime. But, so why are we not okay with that existence, but we are okay with the, the hidden version of it? And again, this is, just, this is the same thing that when something exists in, in, does not exist in analog and exists in digital, we are not okay with its analog existence, but we're okay with its digital existence because we don't have a way of tangibly seeing it or understanding it. Going back to the privatization of our infrastructure, right? We would not be okay with Amazon owning our roads, so we're going to be okay with Amazon owning all of our national security data. Same thing here. We would not be okay with a police officer on every corner. We would feel like we lived in an unsafe neighborhood, and yet we're okay with everybody having a ring doorbell in their house and everyone's movements being watched. Um, so there's, it's, it's interesting, the tangibility or the intangibility of these technologies is in part what makes it so pervasive and invasive. And, and as anybody who works in privacy will probably tell you, the hardest thing, one of the hardest things to explain to anybody is what privacy really is and why it's valuable and why it's so important to protect privacy. It doesn't really seem like it's something you, you need to, you know, very, very uh, carefully protect. Because it's the same narratives all the time, right? If you have something to hide, uh, you know, like, I don't have anything to hide, I'm okay with people watching me is the number one. Uh, you know, reason uh, individuals give, or you know, you know, it's it's close cousin. Uh, you shouldn't do anything bad then. Uh, <laughs> um, but this hidden militarization, again, if we think about it, we are not okay with it existing in its analog form, and yet it exists in digital form all around us. And finally, digitizing existing tension. So as I mentioned, these are not new narratives. These are not new stories. They're new technologies that further shift the, shift the balance of power away from individuals, and particularly minorities, and into the hands of the people who have, have often been their oppressors, the military, the police, people who already have the structural power. Um, so just a few examples. Um, police in Compton, Philadelphia, and Baltimore have used aerial surveillance technologies, um, and they call it Google Earth with TiVo uh, capabilities to track targets. Um, and it, interestingly, a, a, an internal government audit, and like, so the LA, Los Angeles did an internal audit of the use of certain predictive policing algorithms and, and uh, uh, crime algorithms, um, finding racially biased outcomes, like no surprise there, right? Leading to the shutdown of, of things like certain types of predictive policing. Um, and sort of a quote from the article. So these are all links, by the way. They'll be up on your Moodle, and you can read the articles that I drew these from. Uh, critics have lambasted the data-driven programs, which use search tools and point scores, saying statistics tilt towards racial bias and result in heavier policing of black and Latino communities. After the, quote, chronic offender list created an uproar among civil liberties and privacy groups, the LAPD suspended that tool in August. Um, so just, just a word on, on things like predictive modeling for policing. So it's, it's one thing to say the technology is flawed and it doesn't work. It's another thing to say it fundamentally should not exist. Um, and right now, a lot of the surveillance state conversations, particularly around facial recognition, 
talk about how the technology doesn't work. Um, but the goal is not to perfect a surveillance technology. So there needs to be a value proposition. Again, we need to think through the fundamental value proposition that this technology is built around. Because if it's built around, quote, safety and security, right? Safety and security for whom? Against whom, right? And who, who are the people you are securing against? And as if we're like sort of walking through this narrative, we're, we're using the existing narratives that exist, right? The, the, uh, the low-income minority communities are the, quote, ones to be um, policed, um, and the affluent, white, often white communities are the ones to be protected, um, and we are going to literally repeat these outcomes. That being, that aside, I mean, let's say if somehow you were still able to create some completely unbiased uh, crime prediction model, even though you can't, uh, but let's say you could, uh, would we be okay, fundamentally, again, value props and basic notion of an algorithm that probabilistically told you that something was going to happen, thus, thus resulting in someone's liberties being infringed upon because of a probability they would take an action, action they have not actually taken. So when, when I say predictive policing, it's something like there are algorithms that exist um, to, um, let's say, make a prediction onto who is going to graduate from minor crimes to more violent crimes. So then police will have a list of people who have a high probability of graduating to more violent crimes, and they take action on that. Are, are, are we okay with that? Because, you know, if you've seen, that literally is Minority Report, if you've seen Minority Report, and these are, these are the algorithms that exist. This is not like a future narrative. This is what companies are selling to police departments. We can predict who is going to take action X in the future, so you can take action today. Um, and I, 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 frankly, my personal take is I just think it's horrifying from a, a human free will perspective, let alone like even putting aside all the other narratives from a human free will perspective, one should not be punished for something you've not actually done. And the last one to, this is a really interesting article to read, uh, and it, it highlights some of the issues with these technologies. Predictive policing tool in New Orleans was sold without any oversight. So what happens, so we lack the infrastructure in our, in our um, lo especially local governments, to actually vet and understand and analyze these tools. Because they're, they're, that's the problem, they're seen as tools and technologies. So what happened in New Orleans was the police department just bought a predictive policing technology from Palantir. Uh, they did not, because they were buying a technology platform, the same thing as like if the police department bought a whole bunch of computers and then got Microsoft Windows installed, right? Uh, it was not viewed as something that would required city council oversight, citizen oversight, right? So they are just able to purchase these technologies because they are sold as technology platforms, not as something that in, could possibly infringe on civil rights and liberties. So the, the police department was able to actually purchased this technology, and, and they used it. And the city council did not even know this was going on. It never underwent review. So different steps to this narrative, like there is the value proposition of should this thing exist or not exist. There is a second state of what is the kind of society we're building if these technologies exist. The third state of is there bias? Like what about the bias and discrimination that is then perpetuated? We're perpetuating status quo. And then finally, we even lack the, the infrastructure in our own governments to successfully review and audit and discuss whether or not we want these technologies. So even if you lived in a town that, let's say, the citizens, you know, whether the citizens wanted the technology or not, currently these things do, are not discussed in that kind of form. We don't have that kind of uh, internal infrastructures. So a narrative on how to challenge the corporate smart city. I thought this was a really, really good article. Um, so there's, there's three ways, retrofitting, repurposing, and reinvigorating. Retrofitting enacts political subjectivity by indicating the failures of smart infrastructure and mobilizing care and collaboration to repair. Repurposing creates political subjectivity by discerning and experimenting infrastructural arrangements and you transgress the corporate smart city. And reinvigorating, which is my favorite one, where you, you sort of flip the narrative. You subvert technocratic visions of smart cities by exploring infrastructural arrangements um, to, to place the politics of participation at the forefront of innovation. And you can, skip, I think I copy pasted that, so I actually pulled another word. So three examples that were given in the article. Uh, LoRaWAN, which is a digital wireless network, which shows how retrofitting provides an opportunity to expand uh, smart Adelaide. And uh, you know, so what would you say, well, let me check the time before I open discussion. 
Um, so uh, what would you say is, is, like, what was so revolutionary? How, how is this retrofitting to subvert the, the digital surveillance? I mean, it's in the article, but what, what are your thoughts on, on why um, a, an open digital wireless network like Lower One allowed individuals to be part of disrupting the corporate smart city? So if you remember, it was an existing wireless network and they, they retrofitted it to be able to be used for um, individuals like the public to be able to, for example, run data sets in the cloud and do like online, uh, online data science and things like that. So what's so disruptive about that? Yeah? Well, I would just say, um, is the information really being made available to the general public in a way that general public, plain old people can understand it. And if I'm understanding you, I think that by and large we're not getting it yet. <laughs> you mean the, so in this case this was just the ability to have basically free digital Wi-Fi uh -huh. availability and, and cloud compute availability, so it wasn't necessarily open data. That's comfortable for us, but there are other people who could gather that and use it, like as we read about with politicians, the businesses also, and criminologists, which is an area that I think probably average citizens don't think too much about. Probably not. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Absolutely. So it gives you some agency and ownership, um, in particular because you're now you, everyone's digitized. It's it's more inclusive. Um, so the second and third, so DCC beta um, in Dublin, which is a live mechanism for imagining, testing, and implementing ways to improve experience of life in the capital. Interestingly, the company I work for, Accenture, uh, we have a massive office in Dublin, and we were actually part of DCC beta. And essentially, what happened was people could pitch projects. Um, it, it was, and it's actually kind of similar in Boston's public lab, but um, we did uh, design-led thinking sessions like with people in the community, and people would make suggestions um, via this digital platform, and the city would actually prototype and build, um, you know, these the, these suggestions for the city, and then people would actually vote on what they wanted to keep and not keep, and what they found helpful and not helpful. Um, so DC Beta was actually a very interesting way of, uh, and the and Boston Public Lab as well. Um, a, a really great way of sort of flipping the, the corporate narrative on its head um, and working at a big corporate myself. We do a lot of design-led thinking sessions. So lots of, I don't know if you've ever participated in one, but it's basically a lot of sticky notes and, and ideation. Um, but, but including individuals in, in this narrative, in the creation of what a smart city means, uh, is in part how you uh, take the power out of the, take the centralized power out of the, the corporate entity and bring it back to individuals. Now, of course, like all, all of these initiatives had to be voted for and granted and developed by the government in order to include the people. So I'm, I'm not ignoring the fact that it sort of ha had to be part of the design. But I think the narrative here is that today it is often not part of design. Because again, if you have a narrative of safety and security, you immediately close doors. You immediately say, okay, who are the experts? To, fi to find the bad people. Oh, it's the police and the military, not, not elected officials. Certainly no citizen oversight because we have to move to catch the bad people, right? Thinking about um, a smart city as a, a civic digital infrastructure, right, as, as, a di as an extension of urban design, like I was talking about last week, as, as an extension of urban planning and urban design instead of a way to catch and police people is by definition inclusive. By definition, you need to include all of the communities if you are creating a new form of urban planning, right? Because urban planning is about the individual and their relationship to the community, not in making sure that you are finding the people who are disrupting your quote, great way of life. 
Um, so with that, I will move over to Susan, um, who will give a bit of a talk, and then we will have a bit of a break afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. How's everyone? Good. Good? Okay. So my task here, as always, is to contextualize this in terms of what we do here at PSR, the Pacific School of Religion. Uh, my job is also to provide lines of continuity for what you may be reading in other classes or ideas that you may, you may encounter in other classes and what this particular sector analysis is doing. So we want you to have a bridge. So my reading for today that I contributed was George Yancey's article and essay. So I wanted to talk about some ideas in the essay and make some connections to what Roman has already said. She said twice today, maybe in, you know, just uh, gesturing towards it, but I thought it was important. As she said, none of this is new. Well, none of this is new at all. In fact, it's very, very old. One can go back a few hundred years to European colonialism and its, and its gestation and what it created in the world. And one can go even further back, as uh, Yancey's article indicates. But before I get into that, I wanted to relate an anecdote that some of you may know. This is an anecdote, a story about Archbishop Desmond Tutu. You know him. Uh, and the story goes this way. He was walking by a construction site one day, and there was a path that only, uh, only, uh, only one human being could walk that path at a time. And at the front of the path, he saw a white man who immediately also perceived him. And the white man said, I do not make way for gorillas. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, ah, yes, but I do. You may pass. <laughs> so the, I, I remembered this story as I was reading. It's a painful story to uh, recount, and it's a painful story. Uh, that laugh is an expensive laugh, if you know what I mean. There is moral injury. Uh, in that laugh, in, in your response. Uh, we shouldn't be laughing. But that, this actually happened. Uh, but I remember this story because it really goes to the heart of the problem of race and what we are seeing as a consequence of that form of thinking. Our gaze is what creates and constructs the human body. We we see, we see in a particular way, and that seeing constructs. We think it's an objective seeing, and we've been fooled into imagining that the categories and ways in which we think and analyze are value-free. They, val they have no value. They are simply objective facts. Actually, they are not. We only see things as we are. And that's at the heart of the problem of surveillance. Who is looking at whom? It is not new, Roman said. And I say it is not new at all. In fact, it's a very old problem. One of the things about the colonial gaze, and again, you know, we for us, it's easy to think of colonialism as a particularly European problem. While some of these authors are indeed talking about European colonialism, colonialism is not a new phenomenon. Many, many cultures have colonized other cultures. The impact of what we are living is certainly a feature of European colonialism. So just to keep these things in mind. One of the things Yancey says is, the colonial gaze is both mutually exclusive and mutually dependent. So one of the things Roman talked about today was how these systems are creating exclusionary neighborhoods or cities or spaces or geographies. But actually, that idea of exclusion depends on another. 
there is an absolutely necessary other for this situation and this uh, particular argument to function as an exclusionary system. That mutually dependent relationship, he calls it a contingent relationship. There is contingency built into it. There's a necessity built into it. And if you, as scholars or students of religion, were to understand that piece of it, you would find an easier way, or from in terms of what we are studying and what we think about, you would find a way to enter this debate in a completely new way. Yancy also says this, we go from biology, the fact of our bodies, to ethics. From ethics to politics, and from politics to metaphysics. Survey, the, the, the conversations about technology, in fact, uh, narrow our gaze. We, we rarely examine the bigger story behind it. Who is gazing at whom? The fact of the gazing, the fact of its effects on communities of color or on particular people are clear, they are to be seen. But there is a metaphysics of self and other operating here. There is a powerful I, an I that sees, an I that does not itself want to be seen. And that I, which cannot, you can also see as the I, the capital I, that I constructs the other. But it needs the other. Without that other, it cannot maintain its own understanding of purity and superiority. That's the mutually exclusive and mutually dependent relationship that Yancy is talking about. Part of the metaphysics is the understanding of ethics, in a, in a manner of speaking, uh, the nature of good and evil. It reflects what Yancy calls a Manichaean worldview. Scholars of religion immediately should take notice. As Ruman said, this is not new. Oh, this is not new at all. The cult of Mani goes all the way back to the third century in Iran. At one time, Manichaeism was the most widespread religion in the world from the third century to about the eighth century. It was built on a cosmic, uh, or an idea of cosmic dualism. There is an eternal battle between good and evil. The world is divided into good and evil. What is good is spiritual. What is bad is body. What is good is white and light. What is bad is body and black. You know this. These are the dualisms which then contaminate other religious narratives and have come down to our own particular worldview in which we simply accept this as a way to be in the world. There is a battle between good and evil. Ruman talked about Project Jedi and I smiled to myself because I, I like Star Wars. I, um, my brother and I are always exchanging notes about, you know, this little tweak in that one story and the Mandalorians absolutely massacring, you know. Uh, it, it just went off on another tangent, and yeah, it's all very entertaining. But what it's doing is also giving us a grammar, a way to think and speak about uh, good and evil. Project Jedi, I may, as you said, is, an, uh, is a military project, uh, and Amazon, look at the name, Amazon, a, a huge myth attached to this river that gave life to billions of people. And it's, it's the name of, you know, another kind of river now. That capturing of the world's myths, which at one time belonged to religion, we have relinquished. And it is to that responsibility that I want to hold you as students. 
take back those myths. Those myths belonged to a world that understood the battle between good and evil to be a little bit more nuanced, far more sophisticated than the success or the superiority or the winning of white bodies and the failure, demeaning and uh, disappearing of black bodies. That's the responsibility. I said at the, at the opening session, I said, we need to re-mythologize our world. I didn't mean to say, if I implied it, I was, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that we have no myths, we do. The problem is that these myths have become in service of the continuing metaphysics of white is good, black is bad. And that is what we have to interrupt. That's the future, I think, of religion. One of the things that Yancey talks about that is also relevant to this is colonialism engages in a violent geospatial dimension of, of colonial territorialization. Uh, it's been a while since I've been using these big words, even I can't say them. But that kind of taking over territory is matched by a psychocultural taking of territory. It's not just the city space that is taken over. Our minds, our hearts, our spirits are taken over. What kind of responsibility do we have in that kind of a space? Those of you who are readers, uh, leaders of religious communities, leaders of spiritual communities, leaders of ethical and political communities, that may be your task to, to actually say, here are some ways in which we can controvert the taking over our psychocultural bodies and spaces, even as our geospatial spaces we have given to these technologies that are simply engaging old ideas of good and evil. I have said this again, I think, last week. Race and racism is a problem of vision. For a lot of religions, purifying vision was a critical task. How do you purify what you see, and also what you hear, and also what you speak? But in this particular place, how do you purify what you see? And what the religions taught us was you have to do two things. One is you have to look outward in a non-judgmental way. And the other equally important piece is you have to look inward in a non-judgmental way. I have a little uh, half-broken um, statuette of a seated Buddha in my office. It's a little broken and beaten, because when I brought it from India, it broke. Uh, but people often comment on its eyes, the organ with which we see. Its eyes are half-closed. And the intuition here is it's not that he's sleepy, He's not, it's not that he's not seeing. In fact, the idea again is to see is not just to use the physical organ. To see is to look. And you can actually look with eyes half closed. But the half closed eye also, eyes also mean that the being gazes within. Because once he understands with what he is gazing, he will understand what is gazed upon better. We can only gaze with what we have. Do we know what we have and with what we gaze? Those are the pieces, those are the metaphysics behind any ethical analysis of seeing, which I think scholars of religion need to jump in and provide your voice into that story. The great uh, loss here, I think, with the ways in which we have become digitized and the ways in which the human being has become so little of a mystery that, you know, if you think about it, 
Facial recognition uh, software reduces us to our face. Imagine if our faces were to, if something were to happen to our faces. Would we be less than ourselves? Uh, when I was much, much younger, a million years ago, uh, 20-something in there, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a spiritual exercise that I used to engage in in a community. And one of the exercises that we did almost daily was to imagine that we would lose pieces of ourself. So the instruction was, imagine that you lose your left arm entirely. And then you had to imagine that you lose your right arm entirely. Imagine if you lose your left leg entirely. Imagine if you lose your right leg entirely. And then pieces of your torso. And at each juncture, the uh, questioner would say, who are you? And I remember as a 20-year-old being very moved by this particular exercise because I realized if my arms and legs fell off, in fact, if pieces of my body fell off, I don't think I'd stop being me. That mystery of the human being, that we are not entirely contained by our body, has now vanished, or it's in the process of vanishing. Remythologizing the body in its mystery, in its tremendous potential, that is another task facing scholars of religion. Actually, anybody who thinks. To connect from last week and, and this week, uh, I think, the, for me, the most scary thing is not the collection of data. For me, I, I smile. We will only collect as much data as we are. We still don't have God's eye view. We still actually don't even have the view from the moon. We can't look down upon ourselves yet in any systematic way, that is, in order to understand who we are as, you know, creatures of this particular planet. But the saddest thing for me is that we have been reduced to a thing. This was the heart of colonialism. Colonialism succeeded because it understood colonial societies as things. They were not human. They were less than human. They were meant to be enslaved. They had to be civilized. We had to bring the truth to them. Here's the ultimate joke of colonialism. We have returned the favor. The colonizers too now have become things. They have become data. Guess who's coding you all? You see my face? Because they all laugh at me saying, yeah, you went into the study of religion, look at you. You should have stayed here. <laughs> we have all become things. And that is the failure of a religious and theological imagination. That particular, that story of religion and theology was not about dogma and this is how you should behave and sexually this is what you should do and this is what your body should be doing. That is a utter contamination, a bastardization of religion. The story of religion was, here was a creature that was made that had an incredible power to think beyond itself. And here we are running, in, running back into becoming data, to contain, to know, in one way only, tragedy. Sartre says this to the preface uh, of the book that I referred to last week, uh, called uh, the book called uh, Wretched of the Earth by Fanon. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, in, in writing the foreword, wrote this. This imperious being, the colonizer, crazed by his absolute power and by the fear of losing it, no longer remembers clearly that he was once a man. He takes himself now to be a horsewhip or a gun. The police state, we have become guns. We have become horsewhips because we have conceded. We have 
we have said yes to becoming things. We have lost our humanity. How do we re-enter? How do we re-mythologize? How do we go back to a narrative that might help, which is the task of a scholar of religion? There is a clue at the, toward the end of Yancey's essay, where he talks about the Hottentot Venus and the creation of the black, ugly, beautiful, desirable, undesirable, known, unknown female body. That female body that, that captures in her all these dichotomies because she is captured by the gaze of the colonizer. Understand, he says, what has happened to the bodies of women. Because women understand the gaze. Women have always been the object of a gaze. There is a source of wisdom in that experience. Maybe that might lead us out of this impasse that we have found ourselves in, where we collected so many things, we conquered so many things, until we became them. Thank you. One thing I want to clarify before I break, it was Microsoft that won Project Jedi, not Amazon. It's actually, it was against, it was a down to Microsoft and Amazon. Uh, Amazon's actually filed an injunction uh, against the, the, um, um, the, the decision to go with Microsoft, uh, claiming that the, the federal government actually has ties with Microsoft, et cetera. So uh, keep an eye on that, but for now, it's actually Microsoft that won the contact, uh, contract. Not that it makes a terrible difference in the realm of what we're talking about. All right, welcome back. Um, I'm very excited to read your bio of our speaker. So I'm, I'm going to read your long one. I, I liked it. It was good. It was, it was more interesting sounding than mine. In January 2014, Brian became aware that an Orwellian-sounding $11 million wide city surveillance system called the Domain Awareness Center was being planned for Oakland. Intended to aggregate data inputs from facial recognition software, 700 cameras, automated license plate readers, and shot spotter, a little sidebar to the East Bay Express cover story about the project, mentioned that a newly formed Oakland, work, Oakland Privacy Working Group had formed to oppose the plans and would meet the very next day. Brian showed up to see if he could help. Three months later, on March 4th, 2014, and in response to overwhelming community opposition to the planned project spearheaded by Oakland Privacy, the Oakland City Council voted to dramatically scale back the project, remove the surveillance equipment from the, from the remaining portion, and created an ad hoc committee of citizens to start drafting privacy policies for the city. Brian was appointed to and eventually chaired this committee. In the few years since the Domain Awareness Center discussion, Brian successfully fought for a permanent committee tasked with oversight of surveillance equipment successfully introduced ordinances throughout the Greater Bay Area at both the county and city level to implement significant surveillance equipment reforms, advised on and advocated for state legislation impacting the right to privacy and surveillance oversight, and coordinated with and advised groups around the country on how to implement reforms to legislation and policy writing. Brian is presently consulting with various cities across the country regarding citizen oversight and participation pertaining to surveillance equipment and data sharing, smart city regulations, and various, quote, sanctuary supporting legislative projects. Introducing Brian Hoffer, who's the chair of the Oakland Privacy Advisory Commission and chair and executive director of Secure Justice. Thank you. Thanks, Ramon. I really appreciate that. And thank you guys for letting me be here. Um, I'm not as polished as Susan and Ramon, so hopefully you won't mind a few ums and ahs and uh, whatnot. <laughs> But uh, I also hope you were scared by what they said, because um, that leads in nicely into what I'm going to show as a, a, a solution. Uh, the coalition that I've been part of has never lost a vote anywhere. I think we have a very practical model uh, that I hope you folks can uh, appreciate and support and maybe take back to various different jurisdictions you might have come from. But uh, first, I want to kind of get a sense from you. How many of you think that a good public policy, or as a matter of public policy, we should strive for a 0% crime rate? Like, is that a worthy goal? No one? 
bunch of criminals. <laughs> okay, wow. All right. Okay. I, I was just going to judge you by your response to that, but okay. Uh, good, good. I also don't support that, but for a lot of different reasons. But um, uh, we'll get into that. That's one of the dangers, I think, uh, is, arises from mass surveillance. So... Uh, what I'm, going to, I'm not going to bore you with, I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through uh, the framework of our privacy commission and the model ordinance that we work on. I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty details, but I do, I do want to show you uh, some of the highlights and explain that what we've done is really try to address a lot of the concerns that Ramon just raised in her part, which was, do we get a voice? Do we get to decide what sort of equipment is used in our own community? Do we get to set any guardrails in place? Um, do we even know what's going on? Some of, this, some of this equipment, like Stingrays, has been subject to non-disclosure agreements, and obviously if you don't know about it, you can't even uh, regulate it. Mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine from uh, my private side of life was a high-ranking deputy city attorney for Oakland when they first acquired their Stingray back in 2006. They concealed it from her. She was their own attorney, and they didn't even tell her about that. We found out in 2014, eight years later. So we've come a long way, uh, and the model that we've created, I think, has a little bit of something for everyone, depending on your political stripes. There's abolitionists that don't want any surveillance and maybe don't even want any police. Well, we've, we've certainly killed some projects. There's also just friction by creating some hoops to drop to, that you have to jump through or, or forcing more transparency into the process. Uh, we've really slowed the advance of the surveillance state down. So, Edward Snowden hit the front pages, I might be off by a day or two, but I think it was like June 6, 2013. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, the city of Oakland tries to slide through an $11 million mass surveillance project on a consent calendar. If you've never looked at a city council agenda, there's two portions. Consent is for non-controversial ceremonial items like Thank you, Girl Scouts Troop 29, for your recycling project. Okay? $11 million alone in Oakland is a lot of money. That should have required a real conversation. But keep in mind, 2011, 2012, we had a big Occupy protest. Uh, 2012 and 2013, we had an Urban Shield protest, which was a, a gun show run by the sheriff. So they knew this thing was going to be a hot topic, and they tried to slide it through on just a simple roll call vote. Luckily, there were some members of Occupy standing around. They noticed this on the agenda, raised concerns, and formed what was then called the Occupy Oakland Privacy Working Group. A little bit cumbersome. We changed the name at one point. But, so this was supposed to be about public safety, according to the agenda. Uh, but even back then, they were talking about facial recognition, linking up license plate readers it would all aggregate it. Today, most people, most cities like New York and so on, they just call it real-time crime centers. You've probably seen them on TV where it's a big wall of monitors. But back then, uh, which doesn't seem that long ago, seven years ago, but not a lot of people had them. There was also all these federal partners that they were planning to share it with. There's one of the logos you probably can't recognize there, but NICRIC, the Northern California Regional Intelligence Centers where the FBI and ICE and other federal agencies are located. And they were telling us, yeah, we're going to go share data with the feds. ICE obviously wasn't as big a concern back then, but we have been a sanctuary city for a long time, so that was still a concern. So <clears throat> these are a couple of the, at least the G-rated photos that I could show. I mean, Oakland is, <laughs> it's bananas. It's so, much, <laughs> it's so much fun going to a city council meeting because we just have so many characters. Um, and so, yeah, this is a little bit of our our lights that we had out front, got a lot of photos, but you know, there was actually people inside still wearing masks uh, coming into protest, and, and it was a very just nasty environment. Uh, it was not a healthy, democratic conversation. You know, there's just a lot of passion, a lot of energy, and keep in mind, Edward Snowden was coming out every couple weeks with a new revelation, so the energy was constantly there. Um, I, I noted earlier, Ramon said, you know, you know, what does privacy even mean? Uh, we had egg on our face, still actually today. We don't have a definition of privacy uh, in any of our documents. But this first section here, these uh, numbers one, two, and three, we wrote, the ad hoc committee wrote in is what we kind of think privacy means. And it seems to have resonated with a lot of folks. 
So, and I'm just going to kind of flash, uh, fast forward through some of this stuff. So we had a temporary privacy commission to do what? Because we basically killed the project. We had no privacy policies at all in Oakland. We were keeping license plate reader scans for up to five years. The only reason it changed is our ser server caught on fire and blew up because it was too full. So we're like, okay, maybe we should do something about that. Uh, again, we had the Stingray that we didn't know about. Uh, we had Shot Spotter. We had all, you know, a bunch of other cameras and data sharing arrangements, and we had never done anything. So we were tasked with uh, creating them. The problem was in 2013-14, who did we follow? There was no one else doing any of this work. There was no model. And we got lucky that the ACLU came out with a surveillance vetting ordinance that's now law in California in seven different jurisdictions. And I love the acronym, CCOPS, C-C-O-P-S, Community Control Over Policing Surveillance. It doesn't exclude the police. It includes the public into the decision making for the first time. All these decisions have typically been made either completely in the, in the shadows or unilaterally. Even when the police come out to the public, you can see all your elected officials, they always defer to the police. What do you want to use this for? Sure, here's a blank check. And so we, we changed that. We, we first were a temporary commission and then we got uh, upgraded to, to permanent. We have nine members, one uh, appointed by each uh, city council member and one by the mayor. Uh, we're an advisory body. We make recommendations, uh, also on outside stuff. Um, it was a little bit interesting and unexpected. The, probably the first year was not really much to do with the police. It was, it was smart city stuff. Uh, vendors coming to us that are you know, promising all the bells and whistles if we just give them our data. And that's been a really interesting um, situation that we've had to really reform the entire city hall. Our city attorneys, our city managers, our contracts and compliance have never pushed back on the vendor owning the data. They've never cared about third-party data sharing. They've never cared about encryption. As long as you promise us that we're going to get some you know, revenue stream or some amazing benefit out of this, we'll give you the world. And so we've had to start changing that around, partly because those promises usually aren't true. Um, there's a great story, a great example right now in real time. Uh, there's even, I think, additional news today in San Diego. I'm consulting with them to try to get a privacy commission they had smart street lights that were introduced uh, two years ago solely for one purpose, to reduce the cost of their electrical bill. Said they were going to save millions of dollars. Today, a memo was leaked that shows not only did they not save any money, they owe 1.8 million more, and also it came with video and analytics, and they've been using it to uh, crime fight. If you would have told people in the beginning, like, hey, these have video and we might use it to solve crimes, most people would have probably been okay with that. It, it almost became like, you know, the, the cover-up was worse than the crime, is that type of situation. But also just the promises of all these future benefits were not realized and it actually ended up costing them money. So this is some of what we do. You know, we draft legislation, policies, um, make recommendations to the council. Uh, one, what I want to highlight on here is this definition, you know, what is surveillance technology? We've essentially tried to future-proof it, and I think actually our current version is even a little bit more uh, explicit as to, like, forecasting and, and algorithms. But basically, if you can collect anything and tie it to a person or a group, we consider it surveillance technology. Now, when I go walk into a new jurisdiction and tell staff that, they freak out. It's like, oh, come on, this isn't surveillance, or what do you mean? Or, you know, we've been collecting fingerprints for 100 years. But as we've begun to educate them on how many different ways you can track someone and, and profile them and identify them, you know, even just their online browsing habits, uh, they've started to see. It's also a little bit scary. It's like I'm almost alerting them to ways that they could surveil us some of the stuff they actually haven't known about, and it's like, oh, maybe, maybe we shouldn't do such a good job on that, but um, it, it's, it's really designed to be future-proof. And how, how we've dealt with some of the more benign equipment is that we'll just expressly exclude those items. Uh, for example, the city of Berkeley has this surveillance ordinance, and they just chose to exclude you know, your regular old-school stationary security cameras that are on the corners of, of city property. So those items didn't actually have to come through the framework. 
whereas something like facial recognition would have to. This, I'm just going to quickly skip through. This just kind of talks how they have to come with an impact report, which is the analysis. That's what they didn't do in San Diego. They literally said today in the memo, we didn't even contemplate maintenance or operation costs. So I don't know how they predicted they were going to save millions of dollars. But <laughs> So they have to do an up, upfront uh, analysis. You know, Why are license plate readers uh, controversial? You know, What is it about this location data that could be used to harm someone? And ideally, the analysis then informs the use policy. They get to build in uh, guardrails. Um, that's just an example. Here's the meat of it. They have to address these categories, like data retention. Why were you keeping license plate reader data for five years when you never used anything longer than a week? Or why are you sharing data with databases where ICE can get access in your sanctuary city jurisdiction? So each of these categories has to be addressed. And that's, that's been the biggest missing piece, I think, in you know, just municipal um, approval procurement processes in general, is that no one's ever had to do a cost-benefit analysis. I've sat in a room at NYU with 200 chiefs and surveillance vendors, and they're all talking about how they never had to do a cost-benefit analysis. And so I piped up and said, yeah, because it's not mandated, and that's why we're now forcing you to. And nobody liked me. You know, the room got very quiet. But this has to be done. Even if the privacy impact on some of this equipment isn't so big, there is a cost. You are spending taxpayer money. And so this needs to be done. We also have an annual reporting requirement so that ideally it's going to demonstrate, you know, in a, in a good way that no civil liberties have been harmed, that the public safety goals are being achieved, there weren't cost overruns. Or maybe it'll identify um, your retention limit was too short or too long, and, and then we would you know, maybe mitigate the use policy. So I also have a TLDR. Um, this sort of launching pad that we've created here, um, you, you know, first we started with the Big Domain Awareness Center, and we got the Privacy Commission going. We've been able to defeat uh, predictive policing. We uh, worked with Alameda County to create not only this, the strongest stingray policy at the time, but an annual report. It had never been required or produced anywhere before, to my knowledge, anywhere in the world. So that was the first time that we started getting transparency into how this controversial equipment is being used. Uh, we stopped BART uh, from implementing license plate readers. Again, they had no use policy, which was required by state law at that time. And that led to them inviting us in and saying, fine, you've got this surveillance ordinance. You know, we can go that route. And so I worked with them for a couple of years on that. Uh, Santa Clara County was the first to adopt this overall model. And then we just kind of went on a string, uh, a roll from there. I do want to highlight what the difference that a policy makes on that bold text right there. So when we had a stingray, I was able, able to figure out, like through some public record requests and just kind of private conversations, we probably used it about 35 times a year. Now, if you've ever read anything about a stingray in Baltimore, that's a small number. Baltimore is pretty much the most egregious uh, user of the equipment we've ever seen. They've used it thousands and thousands of times, including for uh, what we call the Hamburglar. They went after someone for $50 uh, theft of fast food. And if you don't know what a stingray is, it mimics a cell phone tower. Uh, one of the reasons your battery is always draining, it's looking for the strongest or closest signal. And it bounces from tower to tower. So the stingray goes out and sends a signal and says, I am that tower. And your phone connects to it. And then you know, a guy in a little van will drive around and kind of triangulate your position. The feds have a level of software that actually allows you to intercept communications. The, the locals uh, are prohibited from having that. But that signal can go through walls. It could find you inside your lawyer's office, inside your you know, doctor's office, so on and so forth. And, and so it's pretty invasive. And just by requiring a warrant, by requiring notice, you know, basically letting them know that we're watching, you could see it went from 35 to 3 to 0. And we're about to get the 2019 report pretty soon, and I was also told it's been to 0. So just adding that extra layer of scrutiny, uh, in my opinion, led to a pretty big policy win. We've also kicked ICE out of Oakland. We used to have a task force with them. 
this, uh, this uh, Trump Intel Pro ordinance thing is pretty interesting. We're actually gonna introduce it in Sacramento tomorrow. San Francisco and Oakland, a lot of urban areas, BART, uh, their agencies participate in a joint task force, joint terrorism task force with the FBI. And that is problematic for a number of reasons. Number one is that the feds have a lot lower standards or no standards. They can put you under surveillance with no uh, reasonable suspicion. They can do demographic mapping. Uh, you remember Donald Trump said he wanted to register all the Muslims or force them to register. Um, they can participate in civil asset forfeiture in much different limits than California. So we wrote an ordinance or passed an ordinance in Oakland and San Francisco that says we can participate, but only on the condition that our guys follow our own higher standards. And um, also has an annual reporting requirement so we can see what's been happening to the extent that it's not classified. And so we're gonna introduce that tomorrow at the state level. Uh, we have the first true non-cooperation uh, sanctuary city ordinance. Most sanctuary city proclamations you see allow some level of cooperation. Uh, that's what we used to have until there was a raid in West Oakland in August of 2017. And uh, so we tightened that up. We've disrupted a lot of license plate reader contracts specifically uh, because they were going about to go to Vigilant and Vigilant uh, supplies data to ICE. And um, then we have a number of these surveillance ordinances that also happened. So Berkeley, Davis, uh, Oakland, I, I would say like Oakland started this conversation, which is true. By the time ours was actually adopted, we were the fourth in the country. Um, we got trapped in meet and confer forever with, with uh, some of the labor unions. But uh, the sanctuary contracting ordinance I wrote prohibits the award of contracts to companies that supply data or extreme vetting analytics uh, to federal immigration agencies. So we're trying to use the power of the purse to get private vendors to change their behavior. And uh, Richmond, Berkeley, and Oakland have all adopted that. And that's also another bill we're introducing tomorrow, uh, also through Assemblymember Bonta. He's sponsoring that for us. Uh, San Francisco got all the news in the world. Uh, by that time, we passed the surveillance equipment ordinance. It was the seventh in, the, in California and like number 15 overall. So that part wasn't actually that uh, monumental. But for the first time, our coalition pushed for a ban on uh, face surveillance. And uh, you know that was generating international news when that happened. There's now four uh, cities in California that have done that. And I want to say three in Massachusetts and, and several others considering. Um, so kind of a couple of future things we're working on is, is uh, we're creating an online database to not only share work product, but also just like draft policies and prompts for staff to start thinking. We really want to create this culture of mindfulness so that they don't just release equipment out into the wild before they think about it, kind of like all the algorithms. Uh, we've worked with UC Berkeley Samuelson Clinic uh, from the law school on a set of privacy principles, which There'll be some overlap with law enforcement, but it's more about the other business practices, data practices. What data are we collecting from citizens? Why are we retaining it? Um, you know, do we need to retain it uh, for these certain periods or can we get rid of it? We have municipal ID cards for undocumented folks in Richmond, San Francisco, and Oakland. And Richmond and Oakland both come with a debit card, which has its own financial paper trail. So what are we going to do when a federal subpoena shows up? I actually don't know that answer. And so that's one reason why we're trying to look at those other sort of non-law enforcement practices. Uh, New York has figured out a way, uh, basically when they, I mean the simple, the simple answer is they verify the data and then just delete it all. They don't have a debit card attached to it, so that does make it easier. But we're gonna somehow have to figure out a way to verify, give these folks their ID cards so they can go open bank accounts and, and do other things in the modern economy but not leave that data trail behind. Because that's really been the focus of a lot of my work now is trying to tighten up data sharing practices and either have no retention or very, very short retention. Because that sanctuary contracting bill I was mentioning, um, the, um, the amount of private data that is being sucked up by ICE is hundreds of millions of dollars. 
And the, the big, big companies like Thomson Reuters and Lexus and Palantir are all too willing to supply it to them. So if you've participated in a modern economy, you're leaving data somewhere, and ICE is using it to target folks. And we saw that in World War II. IBM automated the Holocaust. They were the sole source supplier for the punch card machines that they were used at every single camp in Europe. And they helped program that to run the logistics and run the death camps. And we're seeing that right now. Uh, another thing we're working with is, you know, smart kids like Ruman and others. Um, there's actually a bunch of students at Cal we're working on is how to use this new technology to help us. Um, I don't, it's probably not sharp enough from, from where you're sitting, but on the left is a clear photo and on the right the photos have been blurred. And I have a group of students over at Cal that are helping us to explore this because some of our facial recognition bands, uh, well they certainly have a, an exception or it's not a violation if you inadvertently receive some information from an outside party. Right? We're not trying to put people in jeopardy that didn't uh, intend to violate the ordinance. But we also have public record disclosure responsibilities. What if we have to turn over body camera footage? What if we have to do regular video camera footage? But we also want to protect people's privacy interests, and so we might do something like this where we blur out you know, the other folks that are in the background. Yeah, so we, you know, we've, we've got uh, Santa Clara County, Palo Alto, BART, Berkeley, Oakland, Davis, uh, that are all under this model. We're working with San Diego, New Orleans, New York, Portland. Portland's in the news right now a lot because they're trying to regulate facial recognition on both the public and the private side. Um, and, I, you know, I kind of think that's where the, the future is going to go, is, is trying to look at this, you know, this rise or outsourcing of surveillance to, you know, Amazon Ring and Nextdoor and all these other companies that are, in my opinion, kind of creating a sense of fear, an echo chamber telling us that there's all this violent crime out there when really we're at a 40-year crime low. Um, San Francisco's juvenile violent crime rate disappeared. They have an empty ju juvenile hall that they're shutting down. So we're trying to really not only, you know, take over the narrative that we shouldn't be afraid of each other, but also if we are going to use some of this technology, we need to have guardrails in place. And that's, that's my pitch. So I'm um, happy to chat about anything, happy to answer any questions. Uh, we have a lot of work product. If anything you're curious about, you want to contact me later and just can I look at a use policy? or talk about specific equipment you might have in your place. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, so I used to be on the board myself, uh, HIV board, and uh, Washington was on, was on the list of somewhere else. How do you, uh, or do you have to, how do you navigate, or do you ever have to navigate the federal versus, say, the city where you go to jail, or? I mean, we address it in our data sharing arrangements. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, NICRIC is a local fusion center, so there's federal, state, and local partners. There are some private partners, like infrastructure companies, that all share data. So we can get our hands on those agreements and at least control the data that we're sending or receiving. Uh, obviously, you know, federal supremacy, we can't govern them or change their rules or procedures, but the good thing is there's, you know, a handful of ICE agents, there's only a handful of FBI agents or other sort of nefarious actors. That's one reason why they're pushing so much local cooperation. They actually need us and need our data. Well, we can control that part. So at minimum, we could at least reduce the exposure of, uh, you know, the, the, or the threat model by, by narrowing our participation or the data that we supply to them. I was just curious because as you're talking about the cities you're working with, and obviously you've got big counties and big cities, you've got a lot of big urban yep. centers, San Francisco, Oakland, San Diego. Is there work being done? Does there need to be? I know you guys or somebody else working with them, maybe some of the smaller counties or smaller cities as well, like around here, whether it's Monterey or Santa Cruz County or those inland counties. Like what's happening in those smaller areas? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, the, you know, usually a smaller jurisdiction, just because of money and resources, has a lot less surveillance equipment, so we haven't tended to focus there because there's just probably less harm. But 
we've also found some pretty good champions in those jurisdictions. Santa Cruz will probably make the news pretty soon. They're about to introduce a very similar surveillance ordinance. And where they're trying to be groundbreaking or, or cutting edge is having an outright prohibition on predictive policing technology. So that would be the first in the country if that occurs. Uh, it, it's a large part of our success is the very large coalition that we have. We've got 30 to 40 groups that pretty much tag team every single one of those projects that I just showed you. And that's a lot harder to do in a small jurisdiction. There's also that, um, you know, that's still very, in my opinion, you know, naive, also innocent and heartwarming a bit, but, you know, complete belief in the police that they will never do any wrong. And so it's been hard to walk into those jurisdictions and say, hey, this equipment could be misused, let's regulate it when there's no real, you know, opening. You know, there's maybe not that juicy lawsuit or, you know, big protests that got surveilled. And, and so we've just kind of had to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm just curious about how um, partisan the issue of privacy is. Because I can see, like, progressives agreeing with libertarians on this one and what you come across. That, that's our San Diego approach. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it was interesting after the San Francisco win, the U.S. House Oversight Committee called me, and so you had, uh, you know, Representative Cummings and Jordan, different sides of the aisle that are both going, you know, go going after facial recognition. So I, I do think that's, we've seen a lot more, you know, collaboration between liber libertarians and progressives on this. Um, the middle of the road folks are, are the hardest to reach. They've been privileged and never been injured, don't really care too much about the cost benefit analysis and still think the police are probably gonna do, you know, way more good than harm. And um, like the San Diego Smart Streets thing is actually getting us the fiscally conservative mm -hmm. folks because the numbers were just so wildly uh, overstated. And, but, but the privacy angle, it, it should unite the progressives and libertarians on this. And we're seeing that in a lot of jurisdictions. Um, it's, it's really heart, heartening to hear the impact that you're having because I get very disillusioned the more I find out about things. But I just have kind of a meta reflection on this, this whole thing. One of my favorite songs from the 1990s is Malcolm McLaren's I've Been Watching You, Watching Me, Watching You. And um, it, it's like they're surveying so, and then you guys come in and you're surveying them, and I'm sure they have, have created somebody to survey you surveying them. <laughs> and then you guys get like smart. Go and, and what does this do to who we are as human beings to be, to be um, lifting up this quality and having this kind of playing field? So we put that on our, I used to be part of Oakland Privacy, now I'm uh, Executive Director of Secure Justice, but we put that on our business cards. Um, it, it says, I've been watching you watching me. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that's, you know, that's the old, the old tagline, right? Who's watching the watchers? Um, we've, or who's policing the police? You know, I think that's one reason why surveillance equipment has so dramatically decreased the use of it, and even just, introduction of new technology has so dramatically decreased because they know that we're being vigilant and watching. Um, we're certainly being watched. I mean, I have people creep me out all the time that will comment on something I tweeted about in another state three months ago, and I'm just like, how did you know I even said that? Um, you know, as, you, as your own profile starts to rise, they're definitely paying attention. I think on the good hand, folks know that um, We've been working in good faith with like law enforcement and others to address these concerns. So they might think we're a little overly aggressive at times, but it's been a pretty cordial relationship so far. I see there was one there and then one there also. I don't know if the guy behind you. No? Okay. Go ahead. As long as you don't hold me responsible as a technologist. Um, I can take that hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just keep it very high level is that, you know, there's, there's 
person-based and place-based is the two sort of uh, methods that I've seen. But uh, what the algorithms actually are, we've never seen, I've never seen. Uh, apparently part of Predpol's algorithm has been leaked out a little bit, but essentially it's you input data from a number of different sources and, and try to predict some event happening in the future. Uh, in the past, they sort of said, let's go person-based. You know, this guy's a past criminal. Uh, he's got this lengthy record. He went back to his old neighborhood, which also just any normal person can sort of also predict that. Um, that maybe there's going to be a you know high recidivism for certain people, but so they were trying to calculate based on past behavior to predict a future event, and then when everyone was like uh, that is a terrible civil rights idea, uh, violating civil rights idea, you should do something different. They kind of went to place based. Well, maybe need to go to you know 98th Avenue in East Oakland at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, which I could also tell you for free, but. Um, Again, based on like crime reporting metrics, some people base it on you know economic indicators, real estate value, the weather, um, the lead in the air. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of inputs and values that you weight at different things that I don't understand anything about. I just know that I'm not a fan of it. Do you want me to? I can yeah. talk about the models and how they're built. Yeah. Um, so interestingly, like I think one of the themes today is that, that none of these narratives are new. Uh, so the notion of uh, broken windows, broken windows, is like one of the oldest narratives in sort of urban, urban studies and, and policing. I mean, it comes from what the 70s, I think. Yeah. Um, and it was just the notion that um, well, if you stopped minor crimes like literally broken windows, graffiti, etc., you would make better neighborhoods. You would reduce more violent crimes by reducing like these minor crimes and the thought process being like, you know, people will be more invested in their communities, it'd be a less scary place to be. And, but really what that ended up in uh, was just neighborhoods getting constantly harassed by the police and people mistrusting police even more. Um, because any minor thing they were doing, like sitting on their own stoop and having a drink, would be something that would be up for public scrutiny and discussion and the cops to come by. Um, so broken windows policing was, and, and often that was, you know, and then they used these things like, you know, you know, prior write-ups, et cetera, to figure out like where cops should be should be sent to to look for these kinds of uh, minor infractions. So broken windows policing in general, just like we just there's been a lot of evidence, a lot of discussion on how it just does not work. It reduces trust in the community. So why is that? Why is that related to predictive policing? Predictive policing uses prior in, in part prior crime statistics to predict future crime statistics. Now, I'm going to talk a minute about what we mean when we talk about measuring crime. Uh, we're not actually measuring the true crime rate, right? Every single crime is not reported, every single criminal is not caught, right? So what we are actually predicting based on is either, uh, is basically the number of crimes reported or the number of people arrested for crimes, right? That's very important, because there are plenty of neighborhoods in which plenty of crimes happen and we don't know. And particularly if you think about drug use, um, drug use is more highly policed in certain neighborhoods than, than in others. And I forget who it was, uh, maybe it was Tennessee Codes. Like, I forget who, who said it was like, I've, I have never seen a, uh, uh, as much drug use as I saw when I went to Yale, right? Um, which, like, like, hands down, this is this, is this and, like, and it, like the kinds of drugs that were being used and sold, et cetera, right? Um, so like, let's keep that in mind. Just like by definition, what we call a quote crime rate is not the actual rate of crime that is occurring. Um, and also it's, it's severely skewed by types of crime. So these models use things as Brian said, and actually weather is, is not even a joke, it's actually true. More, more crimes happen in summer months. Um, it, there's a really interesting paper on the rise of the use of air conditioning and the reduction of murders, because people like, and, and this is about New York City and Chicago, because it would just be so hot, people would just like get angrier with each other. Like legitimately these things are interesting and true. So it sounds funny, but things like weather, um, but previous crimes, things like income, et cetera. So you, you can do this on an individual basis. So the model I mentioned earlier, predicting the likelihood to move from petty crime to violent crime, that exists, that's being sold, like that is sold to the Metropolitan Police in London, for example, and the West Midlands Police in the UK. Um, and then there are like, and when that gets scrutinized, they use basically heat maps to, to figure out where to send people. Now the other half of uh, broken windows policing is this very common phrase that I learned when I was in my master's program in like 2005, and it's the phrase cops cause crime, which sounds really funny. 
Um, but basically that's saying that like, okay, you think that a place is gonna be dangerous and you send cops out there and then guess what they do? They catch criminals. And what does that do? That increases your quote rate of crime in that neighborhood because as I mentioned, the true crime rate is not what you're measuring. What you're measuring is what be, what's being caught and reported. So then your predictive model starts to enter, enter basically a simple predictive model would enter basically a feedback loop. So it's saying, hey, this is a dangerous neighborhood, so we're gonna send cops there, and then the cops are catching criminals, so hey, that's a dangerous neighborhood. Uh, so you sort of end up in this sort of cyclical behavior. And again, all of this just, um, because it's rooted in status quo, right, it's rooted in the crime rate, it just perpetuates, maintains, and strengthens what status quo is. David. No, I think part of the, there's a gut sense to a lot of the data that you're sharing literally, right? So there's a sense of overwhelm about how much we're being wiped, what can we do around that? And it's interesting the idea that nothing is new. So religious traditions usually negotiate what to do with this divine being, something we don't fully understand that is greater than we are. And oftentimes, we might do that out of fear. You know, so mm -hmm. we create a cadre of people, the priests, to appease this other being, you know, in order to create safety and security. Right. And so there's a set of people who we pay a lot of money to or create buildings for that are going to manage that. And then at different periods in religious traditions, there's a democratization of that. You know, some kind of revolution or a, you know, a reformation that says everybody should have a role in this mm -hmm. to negotiate with this divine, you know, read the scriptures, whatever it is, you know, some way of doing that. So can you speak to what, I mean, fear isn't going to motivate everybody to do anything about this. It has a limited motivation because it basically paralyzes without a sense of agency. Mm -hmm. So what is the equivalent of a reformation of sorts, something that distributes knowledge and the ability to demystify that mm -hmm. being or whatever it is the thing we're trying to overcome? Well, I, so I think what's important, and, and you're totally correct, like a, a pure fear-based narrative doesn't usually work. In this case, it's easy because the amount of action you have to take is so little, right? Buy the ring technology and put it on your doorbell. The cops will handle the rest, right? Just, agree to give it, we'll, we'll do it. So it, it's, what, what this circumvents is, like you can scare people, but if they have, like their laziness will overcome uh, their desire to actually address their fear, so they'll, you know, but, but this is reducing the amount of work somebody has to do, because it's just saying approve this technology or buy this technology, that's it, we'll do the rest, just like just have this technology and I guess sort of passively pay for it. Um, but actually what you're making me think, think about is, is the second part of all these policing or these algorithms in general, I think touches on kind of what some of these advisory groups are trying to do. Um, you need to also identify like what is the intervention being taken, right? So let's say you have this algorithm and it's determining if someone's going to graduate to a violent crime or not. What, 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 who is this information going to and what, what can they do with this information? Does that mean now cops are gonna watch the houses of everybody who's on this list? Maybe it means that um, those individuals will get put higher into a queue for public services or public goods. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it could be, you know, like it could actually, maybe the intervention can work in a way that is more positive. So to your notion of like democratization, it's also even democratization among authority figures. So why is this information again, back to this narrative of safety and security, right, then that makes this information part and parcel of what police and military can do, because it's about safety and security. Now, one could theoretically have these similar models within a narrative of inclusive urban design, but the purpose here is to say, how do we either reform, rehabilitate, or help this individual, because with high probability, we think they may resort to more violent crimes. But our assumption is not that they are inherently a bad person. There, our assumption is that there is some need they have that our services are not currently fulfilling. So it's just like a totally different perspective, but using the same model. And I think part of this is shaping the intervention the appropriate way. Question in the back, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Thanks for your work. Um, I'm a hospital social worker, and I wanted to hear from you all about hotspotting. So where um, the Camden Coalition in New Jersey, where they, they are using kind of heat maps to find out based on like emergency room utilization data, and they're finding like who can't afford their insulin. Mm -hmm. And instead of waiting for them to continue to come into the hospital and track by numbers, and, I, and it would be called surveillance, how do you get that medication to them? How do you get those services? So flipping it 
where it isn't that smart city, and then you might, this might be your last live show, but I think, I, I just, I want to hear more about what can we do that's actually positive, because mm -hmm. that's what you were just Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. yeah, well, at least in the, in the law enforcement uh, context, one thing I've seen that's had demonstrable success in both Richmond and Oakland is ceasefire. So we're using data. Okay, we've got one person that knows what I'm talking about. Uh, we, we're, we're, it, it's a carrot and stick approach. We've, we've used data to identify the, the people with the most frequency to do violence. Their, their social graph shows that they're surrounded by people also prone to commit violent acts. Uh, they've got a rap sheet. So we bring them in. Here's the DA in jail, and here's all the charges we're going to push against you. Or you could go over here and get job training, get your diploma, X, Y, Z. And so that's their choice that they've had to make. And the police are in the room, which has been sort of controversial in Richmond, is a little bit different than Oakland about uh, how much of a stick they have. But generally, it's the threat of more harsh uh, uh, incarceration versus go get these services, go get help. And all signs right now are pointing to the really dramatic decrease in murder rates that we've seen in both Richmond and Oakland because of ceasefire. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's next. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is along the lines of the question that was just asked. So, you know, I guess I don't, I'm not trying, like, I don't want to say something controversial. Well, maybe I do. We're in Berkeley. Go yeah. For it. <laughs> so, like, I feel like in this conversation, there's a lot of like othering of the police and of just like corporations and the state in general. So I was just wondering, like, some of this work, like, how much you also have like those voices in there? There's their like efforts to kind of like reconcile these sides. You know what I mean? As opposed to just like it being a black and white issue, like. Someone just said these, some of these technologies could also use, be used for something positive. And obviously everything that has light also has like a shadow side too. So like hearing the voices from both sides as opposed to just like it being like, because that right now it feels like the other side being other as well. I mean, I, I work at Accenture. Cool. So I am the other side, right? Like, <laughs> and I am the other side, I'm, I'm, okay. so I just want to mention that. But on the other end, like othering is also a function of power structure, right? Like, mm. like there is a notion of like punching up, right? Like. It is not funny when um, you know a straight white man cracks jokes about like you know poor black women, right? Because it, it's, it's just not funny, right? Because like you're punching down, right? So there's this notion of punching up, and when we talk about othering, you know, one it, it you you cannot other somebody who is in a dominant power over you. But to your point, I think like Brian's pointed out, like a lot of the work they're doing is with the with police officers. So this is not to say like, and there are plenty of people who do say abolish police, abolish prisons, etc. Um, but a lot of people also live in the space of like, how do we reform these systems? How do we work within these systems? But then part of that is also understanding that there that there actually is a blue line that you know where, where there's a lot we don't hear about, and frankly, we probably should have that level of insight. And I think what you are raising is that. This is a, a tricky territory to navigate. I think Brian literally just said, like, said this, and in, in this whole notion of, of this, uh, you know, what is it called? Cease, ceasefire. Ceasefire, where you have the police in the room for this, that can lead to controversy. But it has also increasingly been, you know, the program as it's currently structured is reducing crime rates. So it's it's a difficult territory to navigate. Um, and I, I agree with you. There, there's a lot of pointing out of the egregious violations, um, and and I think most of us will say that. A lot of the times, this is not like intentional um, by the departments as a whole. Um, yeah, other times it is, um, but it's often like a structural problem that, frankly, you would have to be on the outside to address. Uh, but there is the inclusion of these individuals, like when necessary, and also even thinking through the examples I was talking about uh, with the Dublin City example. Um, it was there was a lot of corporations that contributed. I mentioned like Accenture was a big part of it as well. Um, so there, are, there is corporate interest and involvement in this, but again, it's very hard um, as individuals of privilege and power, including those of us who are higher income and privileged or those of us who come from corporations or corporations themselves, not to then kind of consume the whole narrative when invited into these rooms. It's, it actually recently happened to a friend of mine um, who organized an event with a small community group. Um, and 
this individual, this friend of mine works at Google, and later was told by the community group that actually we felt exploited, we felt like you used us for a name and our labor to make you and your company look good, and that was completely not her intent at all. So the difficulty here is being the big power in the room, but learning to step back. Uh, all the way in the back. I think the two of you had your hands up for a while. Yep. Yeah. I had a question also about the, the big power in the room. You mentioned like uh, Palantir, big data company. Are they being brought into the table to discuss some of this? Because they're, they're generating some of the, the power, some of the technology. And is that just kind of, kind of a, an engine that's, that's moving forward? And what is the regulation on that? And, you can take and is there some way to redirect some of that um, kind of creative activity to doing more social good than some of this uh, othering and sort of Yeah, and, and maybe I'll kind of address sort of both these uh, questions. Um, you, you know, I encourage you to watch the Privacy Commission videos. You can watch them online or archived. The police are definitely at the table. We have other uh, law enforcement outside experts. Uh, we bring in surveillance equipment vendors as well. We just went through a, a workshop with ShotSpotter uh, to make a gunshot detecting device, but it also can capture human voices. And um, they've actually used that successfully to prosecute people that have identified their shooter um, via the audio. And, and so it is a pretty inclusive model, which is another reason why I think we're getting all these unanimous votes, that we're drawing you know, what most people believe are reasonable uh, guardrails around this technology. Uh, there's a age old, and I'm pretty old, but it's, 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 a, it's, a old, it's an old concept, uh, older than me, but privacy by design. There are an awful lot of academics and other activists that have been trying to get upstream to the manufacturers, to the vendors of these products and say, you know, take privacy serious at the beginning. Uh, and so we do try to reach out to those folks. Palantir right now is the boogeyman. Um, uh, you know, I am a, a bit of a politician, so to me, I want, want to give them an out right now because I'm using them for my own political purposes. Uh, and I don't mind being candid about that. Um, but pretty much every other vendor I've had to deal with, I have tried to talk with them or they do show up to our meetings and we work with them. I, w I would sit down with Palantir. Um, we have a team from UC Berkeley right now that's trying to help uh, Secure Justice, my nonprofit, develop, we're calling it da uh, Data for Defenders. So public defenders usually don't have the resources that DAs do. And so uh, there's a big story, was it Denmark? Just, uh, is about cell phone tower dumps, how inaccurate the location information actually is. They convicted a person, and when they brought in an American expert to examine the technology, like, this guy was way over here. And isn't that like season one of Serial? Right, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, right, exactly, yeah. So when you get this big, like, electronic discovery dump on you, and you're a public defender with 90 cases on, on your desk, you don't have time to go through it. And so there's a lot of innocent people getting trapped by electronic data. I, I see your time. Um, we, are, we are trying to build tools to use for the social good. So those very same scientists that are working at Palantir, it'd be great to bring them to the other side and say, build it for social good. So unfortunately, yep. we do have to end here. So literally, the clock is ticking, and then we're all going to turn into pumpkins or something. It's yes. like our, our Cinderella moment. Uh, thank you so much for all your thoughtful questions. Uh, as Randall said, your Zoom uh, colloquies are tomorrow and Friday, and I will see you all next week. Thank <laughs> you.